Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more conversations in the digital age. Colorful, charismatic, effective. Roy W. Howard may have been the greatest newspaper owner, editor, and journalist of the 20th century. He certainly was one of the century's most fabulous characters. As his granddaughter recalled, he was a man who could make things happen and make people jump. Starting as an Indiana newsboy, he pulled himself up to the top of his profession where he molded and shaped the wire service, United Press, into an iconic news organization. In his 30s, he became chairman of the Scripps Howard Newspapers, one of the two largest news empires in the nation. Who was this fascinating man? Here to tell us is Patricia Beard. Pat Beard has written a spellbinding biography of Howard entitled Newsmaker, Roy W. Howard, the mastermind behind the Scripps Howard News Empire. From the Gilded Age to the Atomic Age, Pat we're delighted to have you with us. Glad to be here. Now, you've written 10 nonfiction books on topics ranging from Christy Whitman to Morgan Stanley, uh, and you're working on a one about Douglas Dillon. Why, why, why did you choose Roy Howard? I had a piece of very good luck. Uh, the Howard family had been secreting away 50 years of diaries and thousands of pages of uh, strictly confidential and sometimes destroy after reading memoranda. Um, they, were the, uh, they were the background to history of a half a century. Uh, these were uh, pieces of information which were uh, never written about in his newspapers. Uh, they were sent to about four of his top editors, and the di diaries were never read by anyone, including his own family. When those were offered to me, it was pretty hard for somebody who's interested in history and social history to resist. Well, based on uh, this uh, tremendous uh, uh, font of research that you uh, uh, did and, uh, and documents you uncovered, uh, are you able to tell us uh, who was this guy? What made him tick? And uh, why did he go into the newspaper business? Ambition uh, was part of it. Passion was another part. Uh, not only did he start as a newspaper boy, uh, which you could say was the start of his newspaper career, but when he was in high school, he won a contest. And uh, this was to the local uh, Indiana newspaper to be the high school reporter. And uh, he wrote each week, he would write a report, and uh, they were paid by the letter. And so he used a different name. He used the name of his high school principal because it was longer than his. Uh, he went on from one newspaper job to the next, always in the Midwest, uh, newspapers which were owned by uh, different, different companies, but eventually by the Scripps Company. So he came from Indiana? He did. And you mentioned the Scripps Company. Tell us about the Scripps Company. E.W. Scripps was a real character. He was, one, he was one of the great newspaper publishers of the early century, along with Pulitzer and certain others. Hearst. Hearst. Um, Hearst wasn't actually such a great newspaper publisher, but he was a very successful um, self-promoter. Uh, Scripps, uh, by the time Roy Howard met him, Scripps was living on his ranch in California, uh, dressed like, uh, like a rancher, always had a cigar between his teeth, bragged about how much he drank. Wore uh, a skull cap. Wore a skull cap. He was a great big guy. And usually thought of himself as a damned old crank. That's right. <laughs> uh, and when he, um, when uh, when people came out to meet him, his editors came out to meet him. They would usually stop at a shop in town, and they would kit themselves up so that they too looked as though they belonged on the ranch. Roy Howard met him when he when he was in his early twenties, and uh, was just beginning to work for the uh, for the empire, and. He wasn't, going, he wasn't going to be anything but himself. So he dressed, uh, as he liked to, in uh, city clothes, a cape, spats, 
a walking stick. He was a dandy. He was really a dandy from the beginning to the end. But at that time, he was, and in fact, probably all his life, he wore shoes with little heels because he was only five foot five and he wore a size five shoe. When Scripps first met him, he'd had a series of meetings that day, and he said, oh, no, another little one. And Roy Howard came in and he said, but a good one this time. Later, Scripps would write about him that when he first met him, uh, he described him as having unmitigated gall. Ah, unmitigated gall. Yeah. So uh, that was, was that the key to his success, his unmitigated <laughs> gall? I think that was certainly one of them. The other was that he was fascinated by people, uh, as any good journalist should be and is. And he wanted, he wanted to know everyone. And because he came from a very poor family and had lived in quite restricted circumstances in, a, in the Middle West, um, he wanted nothing more than to come to New York and meet important people and interview them. And he did. What kind of figured into the relationship was uh, uh, Scripps acquisition of United Press. Uh, can you tell us about that and how uh, Howard um, got involved with United Press? Howard, what, Howard persuaded the Ohio group of newspapers to send him to New York to write a column called In New York. Howard did not know New York. He did not know anyone in New York. However, he managed to write actually quite a lively column. Uh, and he did things like what, managed to interview John D. Rockefeller Sr. when no other newspaper man could get to him. Um, he went out to the summer White House where Teddy Roosevelt was and discovered that while other newspaper were, were, excuse me, newspapers were reporting that um, Roosevelt was uh, the target of assassins, he managed to discover, he, Roy Howard, managed to discover that Roosevelt's office was above a grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, that was the kind of thing he did. So when, uh, when Scripps decided to start the United Press, um, he, uh, Roy, Roy Howard happened to be in New York and Scripps hired one of his top editors to run the United Press, um, that man died very quickly, I mean, within less than a year, and Roy Howard was there. So um, Scripps didn't have anybody else, and he said, well, you give it a try. Howard was still in his 20s. Roy Howard brought uh, to United Press a certain philosophy. I mean, he's quoted as saying... Uh, we shall be thoroughly radical in its selection of news stories and thoroughly conservative in its valuation of facts. Uh, what do you mean by thoroughly radical, and in what respect was he conservative in his valuation of facts? Thoroughly radical, a lot of that had to do with style. Uh, at that time, the Associated Press, which was uh, huge uh, and international, tended to uh, report uh, to the United States uh, press releases from foreign countries. Um, that wasn't obviously really news. And um, Roy Howard's belief was that you should be reporting what's really happening, and that was Scripps' belief as well. Um, so an example would be um, when the Triangle Shirtwaist fire took place. One of the uh, uh, UP reporters happened to be... That was in 1911. Yes, it was. Thank you. Um, one of the, one of the uh, UP reporters happened to be walking by. He stayed there. He found a telephone in, uh, in a store nearby, which had uh, a glass window. He called uh, the office. Roy Howard took down what he had to say, wrote the, the, oh, the opening piece. And when the reporter came back, he was so shaken by what he had seen, girls plunging out of windows in flames. 146 people died in that fire. Exactly. Some... Um, I think all women and, and some quite young girls. Um, the reporter said, I don't think I can write about this story. I'm too upset. And Roy said to him, write the way you feel. The story he wrote was called The Thud Dead Story. And he described how one after another people would fall out the windows and you would hear this terrible thud dead sound. The New York Times, by contrast, mentioned the number of people who had died, and then started talking about the building. Uh, so that was the style that Roy Howard set up, and that had to do with being uh, radical um, in terms of, what, uh, of the, way, the way things were presented. Uh, when it came to facts, he said he never believed anything that wasn't told to him in confidence. <laughs> and he kept people's confidences, but he also knew the backstory. So he was able to, um, to take a look at an article and know whether the reporter had gotten it right. 
Let's go back to Scripps and the evolution of uh, Scripps Howard. I mean, Scripps famously said, uh, I don't think like a rich man, of course he was, I think like a left labor galoot. <laughs> now, how did this fit in with uh, Roy Howard's view of the world? Not. <laughs> uh, Roy Howard. He thought uh, like a rich man. <laughs> he really wanted to be a rich man, although that wasn't his biggest motivation. He just loved the newspaper business, and he loved meeting people, and especially famous people. Uh, as far as being rich is concerned, he, he ended up rich, um, and, uh, and that was a good thing for him. Uh, he lived splendidly, but uh, that wasn't his primary goal. Now, Scripps had three sons, and empire builders uh, normally tried to uh, create a succession where one or more of their sons take over. How did uh, Howard take over this empire from uh, the Scripps family? Well, one son died. The second son got into a fight with his father <laughs> over control, and, um, and then he died. Uh, that left one son who had never wanted to be in the newspaper business. That was Robert Scripps. Um, but now he did want to be in the newspaper business. But, but it was clear that um, E.W. Scripps, the father, did not believe that he could do it alone. And so for weeks and weeks, um, they negotiated about what Roy Howard's role would be. Most of the ne negotiations took place on the Scripps yacht. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they would sail around and talk, and in the evenings they would play poker. Finally, the only way to keep So Howard, Howard was a there, gambler. Yes. He was a gambler. Yeah. Yo. Yeah, he was. Well, he loved cards. He yeah. wasn't a big gambler, but he loved cards. Um, in his old age, he used to play almost every night, play canasta with Herbert Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Another uh, card player. Uh, exactly. That's right. Um, so the only way to keep um, Howard was to make him a partner, and they then changed the name of the company. However, Scripps retained uh, majority control. His uh, the Scripps family and his son Robert had 51% of the stock. Now there's a certain ambiguity here because uh, you know one thinks of the great media moguls uh, as uh, they really were businessmen. I mean Rupert Murdoch or uh, the Sulzbergers uh, and uh, not as journalists. Now Howard was uh, a, uh, a newspaper owner. Uh, he was uh, a journalist and he was, in uh, some sense, a newsmaker. That's the title of your book. So are you able to reconcile these various roles? I mean, quite an ambiguous personality, almost schizophrenic. Well, I think he was more um, omnivorous than he was schizophrenic. Uh, but I think it would be very hard to reconcile those roles today. In his time, when newspapers were it, uh, and there was, uh, a radio was even in, in its infancy. Uh, newspapers uh, could not only report the news, but could make the news, and Roy Howard took advantage of that. Few other newspaper owners could do that, and the reason is because they didn't have the journalistic talent. Uh, they were b more businessmen. Roy was a good businessman. Um, he kept the, fir kept the concern, as they called it, going through the Depression, when Hearst was selling personal possessions just hmm. to keep his own concern alive. And uh, I, I don't happen to be as interested in the business aspect of how it managed, because what we know is it was a great success until it wasn't. Uh, one of the ways he made news was by uh, scooping his competitors uh, through his relationships with uh, various world historical individuals. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, my favorite scoop is when he was Your in favor is a scoop du jour. <laughs> scoop du jour, yeah. yeah. There, was, there were many. Mm -hmm. um, but one that I particularly like is he was in Paris, and he decided it was 1936, and he had an interview with Hitler coming up. He decided that he wanted to interview Stalin the same week. So he sent Stalin a cable saying, I'll be in Moscow. Not true. No plans to go to Moscow. Mm -hmm. I'll be in Moscow, and I'd like to interview you for an article. Um, he got a yes. And so Shows what you can do with unmitigated goal. That's right. So first he interviewed Hitler, and then he went to uh, Moscow and he interviewed Stalin. Stalin did something which was very unusual. It happened that the uh, Japanese were massing on the Mongolian border. They had already taken over Manchuria and renamed it Manchuko, um, and uh, Stalin wanted to warn them off. But rather than doing it through diplomatic channels... An ultimatum. Exactly. 
he didn't he didn't want to give them an ultimatum. Um, uh, he, he decided to do it in a, a, a softer way. So he gave Roy Howard the scoop and he said that if they, if they don't move back, uh, the Soviets will consider it an act of war. Wow, that is a scoop. It was. Now at this point, um, Howard was a, uh, a highly praised and, and, and very well-known journalist. He'd been on the cover of Time magazine in 1931 with the ultimate American accolade. He'd also been named one of the 30, no, sorry, one of the 57 men who rule, in quotes, rule America. On the front page of the New York Times, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was first. So here's a boy who worked five jobs as a little boy to support, help support his family, and now he's one of the 57 men who rule America. Pretty snappy. Pretty snappy. Now, Howard also had a strong connection to Asia, didn't he? He did. He loved to travel. And um, he just became interested in Asia, and he had the opportunity to meet some of the most important leaders, ranging from the Philippines, which is not exactly Asia, but the Pacific, um, to China. He was a great supporter of Chiang Kai-shek. He made a big effort um, for the United States to, uh, to recognize uh, the nationalists, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, as the, the legitimate government of China. And failed, but he kept, he kept at it for decades. Now, he also uh, uh, went to Tokyo and he met with uh, Emperor uh, Hirohito. Uh, that was a really... And what came out of that meeting? Tell us about that. <laughs> that, was a, that was a really blown up story. Um, uh, Hirohito... Blown up by whom? <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by Roy by Howard. Roy Howard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the newspapers, um, uh, nobody got to interview Hirohito. That was the deal. You got to have an audience with him. That was all. He, he, Roy Howard, didn't know that he was going to have this audience, and so he didn't have the proper clothes. He borrowed clothes from the bureau chief, who was considerably larger than he. Mm -hmm. So he had a hat that probably went right down to his eyebrows, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure he had to roll up the sleeves of his uh, tailcoat. In any case, there was uh, important protocol. You'd go in and you'd bow so many times. You'd three back times. Out. Bow three times forward and bow three times back. That's right. And you were not supposed to ask a question. Roy did ask a question. It wasn't, very, it wasn't a very important question, but he asked it. And then um, what was published in the newspapers was that he had had an uh, interview with Hirohito, who had uh, expressed peaceful sentiments. However, he came away from that meeting and concluded that uh, the United States wants to build up its navy to treaty limits. He did. So, uh, what did he base that on? Well, there were, num there were a number of reasons. Uh, one of them was that Hirohito, rather than wearing imperial gowns, was wearing a military uniform. That was a, that was a symbol. But, but you could see it all every place he went in the Pacific. And he had good relationships in the Philippines, and the Filipinos were very conscious of uh, the Japanese aggression in the Pacific. And uh, he came back and he told that to Hoover. He later told it to Roosevelt, didn't he? His biggest, uh, he was, as you said, the advisor to every president from uh, Wilson to Eisenhower. His most important and interesting relationship was with Roosevelt. Uh, that is to say, Franklin. Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Uh, that man. That man. And so in 1933, uh, in October, um, at, in the first year of Roosevelt's term, Roosevelt invited him to the White House, where they spent seven hours talking. The two of them had dinner on trays in the library, and one of the things that they talked about was the Pacific uh, problem, the fact that the United States didn't have much of a Pacific fleet, and uh, how to get the Americans to agree to pay for it, and also where it should be based. And one of the uh, ideas was to base it in the Philippines, near Japan. Um, the other was to base it in Hawaii, where the ships could be serviced. And, and, and destroyed. And destroyed, <laughs> exactly. So who, who favored uh, Hawaii, Roosevelt both or them. Howard? Both, no, of, both them. of them, so, yeah. So they decided on Pearl Harbor. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say they decided because, Ro because Howard didn't have the power to make that decision. But they agreed that that made the most sense. Well, uh, and uh, history will be the judge of that. Now, uh, <laughs> right. in 1931, uh, the Scripps Howard World Telegram, or uh, the Scripps Howard Papers, acquired uh, the New York World to become 
the, the World Telegram is one of the New York daily newspapers, an afternoon newspaper. Now, the New York World was a legendary paper. It had been started by Joe Pulitzer, legendary writers, Haywood Brune, Deems Taylor, all the others. Uh, what was the uh, interaction there between Scripps and Howard over the acquisition of the world? Scripps had died. He died. <laughs> yes. And that was, the, that was the good news from Howard's point of view as far as getting a New, a New York newspaper. Scripps did not want a New York newspaper. Howard had wanted to be in New York and work for the world since he was a boy. He and one of his friends used to go to the newspaper office on Sundays, and they would clip out articles from the world. And so uh, the first thing that happened was that after Scripps died, within two years, Howard had bought the telegram for uh, the Scripps, Scripps Howard concern. Uh, then the world came up, and um, he, managed to, he managed to buy the world by breaking the will of, um, of uh, Pulitzer, which said that it could never be sold. And that was done in court, and uh, he managed to buy it. Howard bought the world uh, for uh, Scripps Howard, and um, uh, why was it, his, and it's apparently his lifetime dream to own the world. Why did he want to own the world? Well, originally the world had been um, the afternoon paper of record in, uh, in New York, and uh, it was a great paper. By the time Pulitzer died, the world had begun to become uh, more of a rag and less important. But in Howard's mind, it was still a great paper, and it had great columnists as well. Uh, and, and he felt that if he combined the telegram and the world, he would have the preeminent afternoon newspaper in New York, and he did. He continued, Howard continued in the newspaper business uh, right up until the time he died in 1964. Tell what his office looked like in, uh, <laughs> in New York. <laughs> well, I don't know whether I should say this on television, but it did look rather like a Chinese brothel. <laughs> you can say that on television. It's <laughs> a lot worse than on television. <laughs> it was red and gold. It had scrolls. It had an enormous Buddha, um, black lacquer, um, lit in, in a, in a stage-like way, uh, a huge desk. Um, he used to go around with this, uh, the scrolls, which were uh, Chinese calligraphy, and he would translate them for his guests. He, he really was in love with Asia, and he brought back some marvelous antiques for himself. But this, was, this office was Asian, and let's say perhaps not a brothel, but it certainly wasn't, um, it was not exactly a royal palace. Filled with souvenirs he'd acquired on, on a number of trips to Asia. About how many uh, million miles did he travel in the course of his life? His estimate was 2.5 million miles oh. at a time when air travel was not easy. Calvin Coolidge said of Howard uh, that he was a world power, influential beyond the dreams of any of its founders. Maybe, maybe one of the uh, most profound statements that Coolidge ever made. Uh, <laughs> Why was that so, uh, if it was so? Was he a world power influential uh, beyond the dreams of any of the founders of Scripps Howard? Yes. And why was that so? Well, what was I'll the key to his influence? The key was he was likable. Um, that was the, and he listened. That made a big difference. And he also began, became known for keeping confidences confidential. So he had, he had this tremendous background. That's why, that's why his papers are so important, because they really are the background of history, the kind of background that's not usually written. So why was he so important? Um, well, I'll give you an example. Um, when uh, the Munich uh, Agreement was signed, it happened that he was in London. He had lunch with Churchill. Then Randolph Churchill took him to Parliament to hear Neville Chamberlain talk. After that, he had a meeting with Neville Chamberlain, just the two of them, where they discussed what was going on. Then he went over to the American Embassy to see his friend Joe Kennedy, and um, all of these people were willing to talk to him. And so why they were willing to talk to him, one can only guess, except for what one knows about his personality. So from being a world power, mm -hmm. in 1964 when he died, uh, UP was in serious trouble. Uh, the World Telegram and Sun was in decline. It folded three years later. Uh, what uh, would you say was Howard's legacy? 
for me, the legacy is the material that he left behind. Um, the other legacy was the creation of the UP into a, uh, an independent news organization. Um, that's a long time ago, but it set a standard. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, the other legacy was that he was forward-looking. He brought his son Jack into the business. He took Jack out of school and took him on a business trip when he was 10 for nine months. Uh, and uh, Jack became uh, the head of Scripps Howard eventually, and he started the radio and te uh, television and cable divisions. That we have today. Now we have to yes. wind up, so I have a question for you, Pat Beard. How was it that Roy Howard was the most influential newsmaker of the 20th century? Because he... He knew things other people didn't know. He knew things that other people didn't know. Thank you so much for Thanks, coming Jim. by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. For Conversations in the Digital Age, I am Jim Zirin. All the best and take care.